Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I've been asked to give a, a very brisk 10-minute speech, so I will try and be brief, uh, as well as try and cover a lot of ground, so bear with me while I do so. Um, Laura and I were talking actually before the presentation began, and I, I think one of my biggest challenges in getting this together was, what do I say to you guys that you haven't already heard before from, uh, from us up here, or you haven't experienced any day-to-day -day, uh, work lives? I am going to take a much more creative skew to it, but I do hope that if there are, is one thing you can take away, it's what a company like Coke is beginning to ask of its agency partners, both creative and media, to do for them. And the two or three things that we're actually beginning to look for becoming increasingly important for us in terms of how we evaluate agencies, how we actually decide to keep agencies on board, and how we reward agencies at the end of the year for us. And I'll try and do that, actually, with as little Coke speak as possible, because Charlie did warn me about that. So um, with that, uh, I think moving on to what you've already seen over here, um, I think one of the great benefits of this job is I, I get to meet with some of the best and the brightest in the business, both from a media and a creative standpoint. And I've got to say, having said that, having met those people and having learned a lot from them, I will say, in the four and a half years that I've been in this job, which is probably four years longer than I thought I would be, um, that what I've seen and heard tends to be the same thing over and over again, which is we're brand builders, we're 360 brand builders, we're media holistic, we're media agnostic, we're media neutral. We are primed to take you into the new media space. What I often get is the 30-second spot still as the starting solution for all of the work. And that's oftentimes because the creative director or the agency has decided that that's what they want to bring to the table for their own agency reel, or that's what they're really good at doing. Oftentimes, the creative is actually disconnected from the strategy at hand. From a media perspective, it still very much skews towards a region of frequency and efficiency play, rather than something that actually really is about taking a cultural conversation or taking a brand platform and amplifying it with the consumer. 360 is at its basic and most simplistic, oftentimes for us, simply someone showing us the same picture and visual sort of replicated across different medium. Or uh, a holding company will bring us a loose conglomeration of companies sitting at the table, uh, from, their, from their table, who basically sometimes can't even agree to actually what they want to do with each other, let alone what they want to do with us. And our challenge right now really is we have brands, we have products that actually, once they're launched, don't change shape much. It is what it is. What's in that can is what remains in the can. So the only thing that we can manipulate from an external communication standpoint is the packaging and the communication itself to actually keep driving both the bottler's interest as well as consumer interest. And so if we fail at that, we fail at everything for us at Coke. Having said that, here are some of the things that we do look for. I think this probably speaks to uh, some of the things that Bernard was asking me to, to address over here today. Um, I think our reality is that we work with a lot of partner agencies, sometimes on the same brand. And our reality and our, our, the, the thing that we have come to realize is that probably there's no one agency that can actually do it all for us. So increasingly what we're looking for is a lead agency to actually come up with a core campaign idea. Oftentimes that does happen to be the advertising agency. And then we look for the partner agencies to actually develop their work streams along that core campaign idea. Ultimately, we're relying on the client, and that is us, to actually decide whether or not we have something that is a huge platform that we feel really comfortable with. The second thing we look for are surprising ways to start conversations with our, with our target audience. And rather than speak to some of the points that you see over here, I'm actually going to use uh, an example of Coke Zero and the launch in the US. The one caveat before I show you the work on that front is, it's probably not to illustrate what a great innovative way it was to do it. I think it was, I think Laura did some fantastic job that I'm so impressed with. I think it's to show that it was the first time at Coke we began to do things in a much, much more non-traditional way. And its success in the US was specifically because it did stuff in such a, a non-traditional way. Uh, 
The basic issue we will face within Coke Zero that Crispin, and this is their work that you're going to see up there, really helped us address was Coke Zero is a diet soda. And we had to like address a very skeptical audience that this was a product that didn't taste like a diet soda, and in fact, tasted like the best soda out there, Coca-Cola. The campaign premise was really simple. Two Coke brand managers who were so irate over the taste infringement of Coke Zero on Coca-Cola that they will do anything to actually sabotage that product's launch. Before you see it, a quick setup on, on the creative you're about to see. Um, the campaign conceit, we actually utilized two standard comedians who posed as Coke brand managers. And we brought in actual lawyers into the Coke company who thought they were coming in um, to discuss an actual lawsuit with Coca-Cola. And madness ensued. Could you uh, play the video? Coca-Cola Zero, a zero calorie cola that does the unthinkable. It actually tastes like regular Coke. So how do you convince a hyper skeptical market that a drink with no calories actually can taste like regular Coke? Well, the first thing you do is file a lawsuit. Or more accurately, you have two actors posing as Coke executives recruit real attorneys to help them sue Coke Zero, a division of their own company, for stealing real Coke taste. We represent the Coke brand. We would like to sue Coca-Cola Zero. Would you say that we have a case? For what? For taste infringement. We want to just sue them back to the Stone Age to send a message that they're tampering with, really, the flagship of the company. It's one company. It's like you suing yourself. Yeah, but, but they're on a different part of our floor. Da, 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 da. We represent the Coke brand, and we would love to somehow bring some kind of legal action against Coke Zero. There might be some taste infringement issues. Oh, so you're worried about... I think it's basic taste infringement. I'd like to stick with that phrase, because that okay, sounds really good to me. It's not a claim. It's not a claim. Could we sue them just to get it in the court to to just just humiliate It'll be these people It'll be, we, you'll be humiliated and you'll we'll get be fired. humiliated and, and fired. you'll get fired i don't want that da, 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 da. you captured this misguided legal adventure on hidden camera and you turn the resulting footage into tv spots viral videos and media rich banners that link back to a website filled with related content like the handy sue a friend online tool which allowed visitors to sue people who might be copying their taste the guilty party received a terse missive on legal letterhead threatening a lawsuit if the taste theft continued. Or Ruin This Man's Day, an interactive game that challenged users to interfere with Coke's head litigator while he prepared the case against Zero. Then you turn the two actors loose inside Coca-Cola headquarters. You know, a lot of people say kids need braces. I say let it work itself out naturally, in my house anyway. This is more important than that where they attempt to sow dissent among the 7,000 employees of the Coca-Cola company. But you don't stop there, because, well, this is a very litigious society we live in, and if Coke Zero really did taste like regular Coke, consumers might be confused as to which is which, the perfect recipe for a class action lawsuit, spearheaded by the fictitious ambulance-chasing firm of Covet and Yormany. CNY radio spots urged listeners to call one 877 0 if they recently consumed a Coca-Cola Zero. Have you consumed Coca-Cola Zero only to find the liquid tasted like regular Coke? If so, you may have suffered taste confusion, a serious condition that charms the tongue and moves directly into the mind. Hello, I'm Dale Yormany. If you could swear you were enjoying regular Coke from a can of Coke Zero, call the law offices of Covet and Yormany today. Dial one eight seven seven Sue Zero and protect your right to taste exactly what you thought you were tasting in the first place. While outdoor boards, truck wraps, and fractional print ads used up the remainder of the intentionally small Covet and Yormany ad budget. In the end, it all made for quite the cultural tornado. The cola wars of the 1990s, Coke and Pepsi fought for the consumer dollar. But the new cola wars may be Coke against Coke. In a new ad campaign, two classic Coke executives want to sue their Coke Zero colleagues for what's called taste infringement. Not surprisingly, the new Nielsen system for rating cultural buzz revealed Coke Zero as, quote, the most blogged about packaged good in the study, mentioned at 100 times the rate of the next closest packaged good and at the same rate as Barack Obama's newly released biography, unquote. Best of all, when the dust from this campaign finally settled, 
everyone knew one thing for sure. Coke Zero does, in fact, taste a lot like regular Coke. I really do want to um, congratulate Crispin for really pushing us uh, past our comfort zone into this, into this space. Uh, and as I said before, it was successful for Coke purely because it followed such a non-traditional model for Coke and how we typically launch products. It had a really great insight into corporate culture. It, importantly, to peel the curtain back on Coca-Cola and allowed us to actually poke fun at ourselves a little bit. Most importantly, it really was a change in model for us in that we no longer did the one-way communication, and I think you've heard a lot about this today, of we have something to announce to you, here you go, done, walk away. It was something where we really did a two-way dialogue and it was a call and response model with the consumer. There was a backbone to the media plan, obviously TV and out of home was a huge component of it, but the media plan really flexed flex as it went through and as we learned and saw where the consumer interaction and the grab was happening we followed over there and we engaged them further and we deepened the conversation the creative and the media moved collectively but the idea remained very much the same this actually began in digital moved to TV went back to digital then went to print out of home and radio came back to digital and then went to events uh, and it's sort of just ping-ponged between all of that front. So there was very little predetermined as much as a lot that was actually done on the fly. And I think really speaks to some of the new media thinking that we're beginning to do. Uh, certainly baby steps for us, but a huge one nonetheless.